Awesome. Um, can can everybody hear me okay? Is this okay? Yes. Awesome. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for, for joining us bright and early on this Tuesday morning. Um, my name is Jeremy, as Alan has mentioned, um, and I am an early stage investor at General Catalyst. Um, we're a VC, one of the largest in the States, founded here in Boston. Um, won't bother you too much with uh, the deets about what we do, because we're here to learn more about uh, the amazing founders that we have here on stage. Um, but I am uh, you know, very honored and, and deeply privileged and excited to, to be here moderating this. Um, so uh, first off, huge thank you to the Start of Boston folks, to Allison and everyone on the team for bringing me in and creating a space for all of us to be, to be having this conversation. Um, I, I'm really excited for what's going to come out of this. Uh, but yeah, anyway, enough about me. Let's get into it. Um, I think maybe the best place to, to kick off is if we could go around the room and do that classic round of intros, um, especially for those folks in the audience who maybe don't know, you know, what you're all up to. Um, and then we can dive more deeply into, you know, all that it is uh, to be said about foundership and entrepreneurship and, and what, and, you know, the, the sort of story there. Um, so maybe let's start with um, Michelle. Michelle, who are you and what are you building? Hi. Okay. Testing, testing. Good. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle. Um, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm living in New York currently. Um, I am the founder of two companies, the first one being the Black Home Market. We are a curated pop-up market destination that makes it convenient to shop with Black owned brands. And um, it's a physical pop-up that started in New York. I've um, been doing it for the past five and a half years. And through that, um, I noticed that there was a need for CPG brands um, that were trying to launch in retail and lacked um, the working capital to do so. So I'm currently founded um, Catapult, which I've been working on for the past six months. So I'm, ex I'm happy to be here, happy to be on this panel with you all this morning. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. Uh, maybe Winston, we can talk to you next. Love the testing, testing as well. All right, uh, Winston Daly, founder of Agogos. Agogos is the hiring uh, platform for black and brown educators um, with the mission of helping with the pipeline as well as connection of more educators of color into the system, um, working on the issue that less than 20% of our teachers uh, identify as Black, Latin, or uh, Asian. So I've been working on the go for the last two years, um, previously worked in institutional banking, and very happy to be here to talk to some founders and talk about the uh, sort of ups and downs of uh, startup life. And uh, last but certainly not least, Ashley. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ashley Reed. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Wellist. Uh, we've been at this quite a bit um, through the ups and downs of running a, a digital health company through a pandemic. Uh, we started by providing consumer navigation programs to health systems to better connect their patients to support. And in doing so, uh, drove value for our clients by increasing revenue and keepage for the health system, saving nurses two to five hours a week, and then improving the patient experience by connecting people to things like transportation and meal delivery and child care. And over the course of the pandemic, as you might imagine, one, my teams couldn't go to work. So that was an adventure on how do you manage a healthcare business without being on site? Um, but two, all of the nurses said, we really need this type of support given the things that they were managing personally at home. And so, uh, really excited over the last six months to be expanding into uh, supporting employers, not just with health systems, but beyond that, given the, the strength of our initial staff programs in, health, in healthcare. So it's kind of like being uh, er, very early again, <laughs> talking to all kinds of uh, organizations like big banks and uh, union driven one site manufacturing companies to try and learn as quickly as possible. So. It's really fun to be back with you and be part of the conversation. Awesome. Um, 
it's it's really awesome too. I think hear all the intros, especially because of how I think deeply connected you all are to to what you're building. Um, this is really awesome. Um, so I think you know this session uh, is all about taking that leap into entrepreneurship, uh, literally called taking the leap. Um, uh, and I know that we have a ton of you know aspiring or early uh, career founders who are listening in today. Um, I think part of the reason why this conversation is so important is because there are there are a ton of preconceived and prevailing notions about what it is to to be a founder. Um, and so I'd actually love to flip the question to you first to, I think, start off the conversation. So maybe Ashley, we could start with you. Um, what, what does it, what in your opinion does it mean to be a founder or like what does foundership mean? <laughs> I used to describe it as a psychotic break until someone thought I was being literal. Um, uh, it's just seeing something that doesn't exist yet and then trying to be, bring your best, most resilient creativity to have that thing exist in the world. Um, and along the way, really trying to find your people, uh, which I have to say, like, kudos to Startup Boston, kudos to Boston. Um, I started my company pre-Me Too. This panel would have never existed. And so I think we are doing the work to build more inclusive, supportive startup communities in Boston. But I just want to acknowledge the milestone that had I been in the audience uh, as an early founder, this would have not sort of been the, the panelist structure. And so I think a lot of foundership for me has been focused on finding a problem that I am deeply personally passionate about. And then I argue like, throw your body at it uh, for many, many years uh, and learn how to uh, pick yourself up off the ground when things get hard and um, just continue to work towards that goal. So uh, for me, it's always been about what's the purpose of the business? How does it impact people who require support and need community and being able to play a part in making that a reality? I think that that is a I think that that is a phenomenal uh, answer. Um, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll double click on this later, but I think the point you brought up about resilience is especially important because I think you mentioned it, part of being a founder is seeing, thing, seeing something that doesn't exist yet. And, in, you know, continue to that is there are a ton of other people who also won't see what you see. Um, and so resilience is such a huge part of the equation. Um, Winston or Michelle, either of you want to hop up next um, and tackle that question? What does it mean to be a founder? Yeah, we can go to Michelle. Um, I would say having having a mission that you feel so strongly about that you can't sleep at night, you think constantly about, um, so much so that you have the audacity to quit your job and go at it full time. Um, and through that, um, have the, having the ability to hear no and no constantly over and over again, and still having the resilience, like Ashley said, to get up and keep going because you believe so strongly in that mission. So much of being a founder is, is hard. It's really difficult. Um, but honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. I think the autonomy over my schedule is the one that I that I love very deeply, um, and also like just the passion for my community and what I'm building, and the the feeling that I feel that I have the ability to make a change. Um, that's that would be my answer. Awesome. Yeah, I would say it's really just, to me, it's dreaming. It's, it's a imagination, you know, I think actually just re reference, just wanting to create something that doesn't exist. Uh, that's all, we, how we all come to this is like, what's out there? What are the problems that I see? And having the audacity to think that you're the one that can fix it or be a part of helping it or build the product or code or company that, is you know the, the the staple the brand for the issue that you pinpointed 
Um, so it's having a lot of faith in yourself, even though I know we may talk about um, imposter syndrome later, but just the idea that you would try, that you would take on the responsibility and something that no one else has to create um, and and build your community and build your product and put yourself out there to hear no's and you know take a risk. It's 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 an incredible endeavor, um, no matter what level of success you get to. So having the bravery to step out there, that's how I view being around it. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm curious if if uh, the three of you sort of reflect back to when you sort of first uh, committed to going full time on what you're building now. Um, I know that sort of moment is uh, something that a lot of folks are interested in hearing about. But before we're even diving into that, I'm curious if the sort of notion of being a founder has changed at all. So if you reflect on like when you first started your companies and thought about you know being entrepreneurs, being founders, um, was your notion of being a founder any different from how you think about it now? Um, I can start with that. I, I, had the, I was able to actually start full time right away. Uh, I had stepped back from my previous career right before the pandemic. Um, and then I did that because I wanted to build something, even though I wasn't sure what it was going to be. I knew it would be in the social entrepreneurship space. I knew it would be something around um, helping folks of color. Um, and the idea of teachers and schools came to me from working with the schools uh, in my town. So I was already full-time, so I didn't make that transition. But I think that's also a few, a lot of us here may have also had some pandemic induced uh, ideas and ventures where you got a little bit um, different amount of space to work on something. So I, I think with any venture, even in the beginning, if you are full time and you have the ability to do it around the clock, you're always sort of testing it out and figuring yourself out in that in that beginning. Um, whether you're going to work during the day or and working on a night or you ha you have it from, you know, all the time. So that beginning part, that part of turning from ideation to execution, um, that that goes on 24 hours a day, like Michelle is saying. It's, you know, you're thinking about it no matter what. You think about what you're eating. You think about it um, taking your walk, working out. It is constantly on your mind. And so um, that's how I, I view the the start of it. It's like even if you are even if you are working in a job, the ideation is twenty four hours a day, no matter what you're doing. Absolutely. Um, maybe Ashley, we can go to you next. I hadn't planned to start my to to be a founder. I walked into a meeting thinking I was going to get a release. I was a, a corporate strategy director at Philips Healthcare, and. Uh, had gone through basically a nine month process to get a waiver so I could do this as a hobby. And they came into a meeting, which I expected paperwork and said, look, you call on heads of hospitals around the world. You can't do that in a dual capacity. So like, we'll buy the idea from you. Like, what do you want to go do? You want to go to Latin America? And before I could stop the words, I said, well, what if I leave? Like in a meeting. <laughs> so uh, my best friend's father had died of cancer. She went into preterm labor in 24 hours of her dad dying. And it was horrible. And I felt like there was this thing that could, there was this thing called the internet. That's like literally the only thing I knew at the time. I was like, I feel like this should be better. Like she should be able to get her kids to school and dinner on the table at the same time she's managed baby, managing a baby in the NICU and planning her father's services. And so, um, it wasn't an impulse. I had not saved any money. So I spent down my 401k over the first two years of getting the company off the ground. I had not done any of the diligence. Um, but your question around like, how do I think about it differently is, is interesting, especially now that we're expanding into a new market. I think what I would observe is the first time around, I thought I had to have all the answers. And so I didn't uh, put together a fundraising deck or a commercial deck um, until I didn't ship a product until I thought it was ready because I felt like it had to come from me and then I could take it to the world. Um, as we're entering a new market segment, my perception of what my role is, is really different. My role is to ask the best questions and get as smart as fast as I can. And so while it took us three years to really understand the ins and outs of selling to health systems, we now are like, we want to have that learning term in three months. 
we have an MVP product that is obviously not going to be what it's supposed to be, but I don't want to take three years to get there. So my team's focused on talking to 50 HR leaders in all kinds of different industries in a 90 day period so that we can learn faster. And so really thinking very differently. And then the gift of that is that I was so anxious. I felt the heft of the responsibility of being right the first time. And now I have a lot of fun focused on how do I help my team learn as quickly as possible. And the privilege of doing this the second time is I now have a team around me. And so my job is to enable their learning versus to having to have the best answer come out of my head. And that's been a real gift. Awesome. I awesome. love that. Um, and also best of luck with the new market launch. I know that that must be so stressful, but that's so exciting. Uh, so congrats, first of all, uh, but best of luck as well. Um, and then maybe Michelle, we can, we can uh, end with you here. Um, so I was working a nine to five while simultaneously starting um, the bomb, the black one market. And I started it in 2016. So literally it was like nine to five and then seven to about one to 2 a.m. working on both. Um, and the same thing, I, I took out my 401k, probably like 90% of it to start my first pop-up as like a proof of concept. And I was like, okay, if nobody comes, then that will just be it and forget about, you know, this thing. But I couldn't sleep at night. I had to kind of at least test it out first and it turned out to be a success. Um, and there was a lot of articles I remember at the time written about me because there was just, um, the concept was really new. It's, we were, we created kind of the blueprint to exclusively shop with black owned brands in person. And, um, I remember like there were articles on LinkedIn and at that time I was at a startup and, um, the CEOs caught wind of it and, um, they kind of, they pulled me into a room and they, they asked me, you know, is this something that you're doing full time? And at that time I was like, it's just a passion project knowing in my mind it totally wasn't. So I'm um, still being really good at my job. I was in, in digital marketing and, you know, it was a numbers based business. So I was still crushing it, doing really well. But then a few months later, as like time went on and the bomb actually became a bit bigger, they ended up laying me off and saying that they didn't really have a budget for my position anymore. Um, which I know was total BS um, because I remember in that first meeting that they pulled me into, they said, you know, we're a startup, we're a startup founder, so we know um, what it takes to be a startup founder. And it just, I don't know how you can focus on both. So it kind of was a blessing in disguise because I never went back to a nine to five after that. Um, I still was not prepared to be full time on the bomb, but. I had a really good severance package and collected unemployment for about a year and a half. Um, and then it living in New York on my own became really difficult. So um, I moved back to Boston um, and lived with my parents for a little bit. And honestly, it was an uphill battle in like raising money for the black home market just because it was, people felt like it was a niche market until 2020. So like four years of just fighting for this mission until 2020 and this racial reckoning and uprising and the murder of George Floyd, where people were like, oh, you guys are actually dealing <laughs> with issues. And, you know, there was a lot of funds around black owned businesses, people trying to partner with the bomb and things became a little bit easier and bomb actually didn't become profitable until last year. So we got our first VC check at the end of 2021. And I also decided to expand with this new business, new business in Catapult. And we have um, a few interested investors that, you know, we're, we're sifting through and negotiating with right now. So it, it's, it wasn't an easy transition at all. Um, it's just a, an interesting chain of events that happened that kind of led me to where I am now. No, absolutely. Um, thank you all, all of you for sharing, I think, the origin stories um, behind your companies. I think it's all really important to hear. I, I think, Michelle, 
your your uh, comment here is, is a really good segue into, I think, the sort of like grander uh, uh, theme that we've been talking about of sort of like, you know, self-care um, specifically as a founder um, uh, in tech. I, I think one of the things I would love to tackle, uh, Winston brought up, is this sort of notion of quote unquote imposter syndrome. Um, uh, would love to to chat a little bit about, I think, maybe some of the sort of expectations that you feel have sort of been put on your plates now that you are a, a founder, um, whether those are, uh, you know, justifiable or not. Um, so curious if we can just go around the room and, and talk about, uh, you know, now that you are an entrepreneur uh, working on what you're doing full time, what are, what are some of the uh, uh, call it pressures that you've been feeling maybe outside of, of the company. Uh, Ashley, do you want to start off with that one? Um, I'm sure that five years ago, I would have had a different answer to this. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've gotten much better at, um, thinking about my role and my care than I did in the early days of building Wellist, for sure. A good example of this is I do not compromise my sleep anymore because I have gone through periods of chronic sleep deprivation and it didn't serve anybody. It certainly didn't serve me. It didn't serve my team. It didn't serve the business. Um, I think you learn like everything, when you manage a startup and you look at the business, there are a hundred things to do and there's bandwidth for three. So you have to figure out what are the three most important things you do every day. So I talk with one of my colleagues and I'm like, yes, there is a 20, there's a list of 20 things, but what three to five do we have to accomplish this week? And that means like numbers 19 and 20 are never going to get on the list. And so after a quarter of this, we just take them off, right? The same is true for your life. And so when I was at Bain, there was a really good tool. It's called like a spider chart. Um, and basically what it does is assesses on what are the things that are important to you, whether it's family or fitness or financial health, and basically assessing every six months, like, where are you in an ideal state? Where would you be? And so about every six months, I sort of pull up and say, this is way out of whack. So I need to get on the Peloton because my knee's broken, right? Uh, I saw David Chang earlier. Uh, I had my second patella realignment while I was raising capital. And I didn't do my rehab as adherently as I should have. And at 38, they were trying to convince me I needed a um, total knee replacement as a result. And so I've learned my putting the business first and always making them one, two, and three, that that not only is that not the right thing for me personally in leading sort of in a way that I would aspire to, but also it's not sustainable and it, it doesn't serve my colleagues or my business because I'm not bringing the best energy back to the company. And so, yeah, I, I definitely am still on that learning journey, but have learned the hard way a couple of, of non-negotiables. Absolutely. 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 Uh, Winston, do you want to hop in here? Yeah. So I'm in, I'm still in the stage where I am a solo entrepreneur at this point. And so I don't feel any pressures um, necessarily around the building of the business because right now the time that is being used is, is mine. Um, I have a young daughter who just entered high school. So I don't think there's going to be a point where I put anything above her or sort of uh, home. So you find ways to work around and with that schedule. Um, you know, Michelle talked about working from seven to one, and sometimes that's what I'm doing. If I have things to do with her and, you know, I think we're all doing the schedule send on our emails on our newsletters and, you know, talking with our developers and folks that are working. So I think the pressures come in um, later with customers and employees uh, when you think that you, when you need to be delivering the best for people who are now counting on you, uh, that's where I feel that pressure coming in. And that's why I've sort of put that 
um, later, where I want to build a greater base with the Gogos, um, having more um, more back, more sort of uh, you know back help in place, so that when I have employees and folks that are working on my marketing and my development, that I am at the best place for myself where I can work with them because that changes. Um, and as an entrepreneur, just there are stages of wh what you're meant to do and understanding that stage and what your role is, where you go from the beginning where it's just you, where it's just you and your team, to then serving your employees and your customers and the point where you may just be guiding the mission of your company. And it's not you in the day-to-day -day anymore. And being able to see the point where your company is and what's needed of you. So it's that flexibility that you learn really early on. Um, also, depending on where you are in your life and your career, how much of yourself is being given and at what time um, that part of yourself is being given. Because to burn yourself out, to exhaust yourself does not serve your company. Um, it is a great story to talk about how you did everything 24 hours a day. But if you burned out, you can't see it through the end. Um, you know, what was the purpose of all your work? So that's how I see it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then Michelle. Um, so I think my biggest pressure right now is around fundraising. Um, I've never done it before. So it's it's one of those things where I'm pretty much learning everything as I go. Um, and especially being just a Black woman founder, um, the odds are really stacked against me. Um, I try to not really think about that, but, you know, it comes up every single day. So it's it's one of those things where as I am navigating this space of actually getting term sheets, um, now it's the next stage of, okay, these people are giving you their money. Um, now you actually have to prove that these things that you said you're going to do are actually real and go do them. Um, and also being responsible for people's livelihoods as a CEO, as a founder, um, it's not something that I take lightly. So just the pressure of just everything happening all at once at the same time and not having really a blueprint to follow because I mean, no one in my family has really done this or people haven't been around me that have done this, but I, I do have peers and friends in the entrepreneurial space that I can kind of lean on, um, which is great, but it's, it is challenging um, to even think about, but, you know, even more so challenging to execute, but, you know, getting through it. Michelle, what are the, um, uh, any things that you do sort of leave space for yourself outside mm -hmm. of the company or, or just for your own self-care? I know you brought up the sort of like village of people around you and, and Ashley and Winston, I would love to talk about that mm -hmm. as well. But Michelle, curious if, if there are any other things that you do uh, for yourself to, uh, yeah. you know, I would say, honestly, not being um, a slave to just the concept of busy. I find that a lot of founders around me, I hear like, I'm so busy, I have like a ton of meetings, but like, you know, what work are you actually doing? So being intentional about my time has been the, the biggest godsend for me. So if I do need to take a break and go home and spend time with my, you know, my parents, I do that. If I do need to, you know, hop on a trip and go away for a little bit, I do that. It's a working trip still, but, you know, to be on the beach or be on the balcony with a nice view, taking calls is much better than driving myself crazy in my apartment. So I do take the time to um, listen to my body and, you know, see what I need. Also, you know, I usually start my day, um, with meditation and a prayer. Um, and on most days I try to work out, but it hasn't been the case lately. So if, if things are going well, <laughs> I, I do that. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, actually Winston, Michelle brought up the sort of the, you know, this idea of having this community around you that you can, uh, uh, uh tap into that you can sort of come to for like for support, um, as you're building your company. Would love to hear about, uh, I think Winston, when we had talked about this previously, you, you sort of described it as the scaffolding um, uh, around you. So so curious in, in learning more about those villages that you that you've sort of built for yourself. Yeah, so for me, um, I jumped into two industries um, where, I, where I had not previously been. 
one being education and two being um, tech and startups. So uh, the first thing I did was try to start reaching out to people, um, whether that's cold emails, um, DMs, whatever it takes. And, you know, many people will get back to you. And through those conversations, you start to figure out um, what the community of folks you're building for yourself will be. I also jumped into a lot of accelerators and particularly community accelerators. Um, I wanted to work with folks that were from not only the neighborhoods and, and folks that I wanted to serve, but people who are from, you know, sort of the neighborhoods where I was from, right? Like I'm from inner city Boston. And so um, it's a very different to be in an MIT accelerator um, versus one like e for all that's for folks um, within Boston. So, and then also um, nationally, the people I reached out to, I'm, I'm in probably seven different Slack groups of folks that are in ed tech, uh, people that I may never meet, but that they may serve as a resource. People send me information about the industry. We discuss um, plans, talk about entrepreneurs. So really, you're going to need a lot of groups. You're going to need your entrepreneur group because maybe that's not where your friend group or your family are, right? So you need folks who want to understand what you're building. You need folks to technical knowledge. Um, we're all building things online, apps. You're going to need folks to, to support you there. And then you're just going to need those people that you can just talk to, right? Um, I can say personally, I always have a need. I always love just talking to founders, no matter what stage they're in. When you have that honest conversation about stresses or the day-to-day, -day, or as Michelle said, the horrors of fundraising, you know, the amount of times you need to put yourself out there to raise money and have folks question what you're working on and then being the steward of someone else's finances as well as someone else's career and livelihood is really important. So I think building as many um, villages as possible, it won't be just one group. Um, perhaps you will be able to find just this great founder set that will be there for you. But I think for me, it's been best to reach out to a, a lot of other folks and just find what people have. But in that vein, I will say, and Michelle made me think of this when she was talking. Please, everyone, when you're in the beginning, be mindful of your time. Um, you do not have to take every call. You do not have to jump on any Zoom. Unfortunately, there will be a lot of conversations that will just be a waste of time. Um, so please be mindful of your time and your mental health and the people that will. I've In the start of this, I had so many people that wanted to take meetings or so many people that wanted to, quote unquote, mentor me, which never got me anywhere, right? It's a lot of two hour conversations that lead me to nothing. So be mindful of your time and protect that asset because it's what you have to build your business and let folks waste that. It's uh, the most important asset. Uh, I think that's fantastic advice. And then Ashley. Yeah, I, I think Michelle and Winston highlighting the impact of time is 100% correct. The only thing I built on is the more I do this, the more judicious I am with um, being very defensive about what energy I let into my ecosystem. And so whether it's uh, peers or investors or a team members, if you get good energy, it lights a room right and if you don't it it can sort of put blinders on and so um i do not go to 80 percent of the conferences i went to five years ago i um am very conscientious about the real conversations that we have so i think on the pre-call i gave the example that we were at a sort of big, douchey healthcare event this spring. And uh, one of my friends came over and she happens to be a boss ass black female founder who's raised $25 million from JP Morgan. But she says, oh my gosh, I just talked to this person. And he said uh, he wasn't taking a paycheck in here. Like I thought I was failing. And I'm like, well, this guy just sold his company for $3 billion, $2.5 billion, and he mortgaged his house. This guy is on his second company, um, having sold the first one for a huge return, just closed an $18 million term sheet and hasn't taken a paycheck in 18 months. And so we all have the realities of the things that we've sacrificed, but we have a culture, I think, fed by this idea that 
the, I'll call it like the up and to the right bias of investors that we always have to be selling the story. And it comes at a huge cost um, and personal suffering to entrepreneurs who are doing the work of solving real problems for real people. And so I think the more I do this, I ask, I, I'm very thoughtful about, is this person bringing the right energy and the right intent to the conversation and the right, you know, vulnerability to be a partner in this, either as a peer or as an investor. Um, now that's different than every person I go to. I want their most ruthless candor of how my business can improve. So I'm not looking for everyone to say, well, it's just great. I don't learn if people aren't bringing new ideas and new challenges to the business. But there's a way to do that that's very generative versus um, demeaning. And I have some pretty hard boundaries about that now that I didn't have when I started. Actually, I, I would love to, I think, double click on, on one of the things you brought up. We, we've been talking about fundraising for the last couple of minutes or so. Um, and I think this is, I think everything that you're saying is true. So would love to hear about how you've uh, uh, manage this balance um, between not even balance, but sort of manage the expectations of yeah that up and up and to the right uh, 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 expectation that investors bring to the table with you know what you're trying to build. What what is sort of navigating that been like? Yeah, I mean I I've learned the hard way that I can spend an hour trying to sell to a client and an hour to the investor, and I'll get a return from the client, you know one in five times and I'll get a return on the investor only after I have the client. So I have a bias for spending my time commercially facing. I also have learned like, look, you're an investor. Your job is to create wealth for people who arguably have enough money to invest in your fund. And so um, the people who you just learn sort of who are your people. I am a very mission-driven entrepreneur. That is not everyone. I don't give a fuck how much money I make. If I help people who are in need, like, and that is my life's work, and we do that at scale, but I personally, I, I feel responsible to my investors and in making them successful and being a good st steward of their, their capital. That's different than am I optimizing my personal return for something I would trade a hundred times my impact. And so the investors and partners that I see are as committed to the impact of my business because I lived through a pandemic when my teams couldn't be on the ground in healthcare and parts of healthcare boomed and parts of healthcare got eviscerated for a two year period. And you saw investors trying to optimize and put their chips in the things that were booming. That is their job, right? But I was trying to make sure that the people who needed drugs delivered to their house got it. And so we put a site at, in Chelsea when it was the hardest hit part of town to literally stand there and connect people to support. And we enrolled 45% of patients. And that may not have been the best financial thing to do, but it was 100% the right thing to do, right? And so the people that I now have bias. So a bias of doing this for a while. So I know who is doing what. I know that this sort of blue chip venture capital partner is not the right one for me, but someone like Morgan Health, where Oriel Richardson comes from government and uh, is the head of health equity, and their whole fund is about improving employee well being. If we want to go into the space, that's a great partner for us. Um, uh, Liz Rocket, who managed Kaiser's Venture Fund, and um, Aya Ram, who built City Block, are now spending all of their time thinking about better ways to fund social impact organizations because there is this inherent bias if we touch people on the best day of their life. And so I have to tell you, like, it's nauseating to me when we work and um, Zenefits founders get these record raises. And we can't get people like Winston's company or Michelle's company, like the funding that they need to thrive. I think it's inexcusable. And like, I really hope that we can build communities that actually are more equitable 
and do the real work that needs to be done in the country. And I don't think that venture actually supports that long term. Sorry. So that's what I really think. <laughs> No, I, I think I think it's it's really valuable uh, to hear it because I, I think frankly it's it's sort of reality. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I think if I had to say anything too, um, I think it's especially valuable the commitment you have to customers um, first and foremost, uh, or to the people who need what you're building first and foremost, um, because at the end of the day, that's who you're that's who you're starting your company for. That's who you're building for. Uh, so I, I think that's incredible advice. Um, I know that we have uh, three to four minutes here before we turn it over to the audience for uh, any questions that they might have. So would love to just open it up. Uh, if any of you have any last tips or advice you wanna give to folks in the audience who are thinking about starting a company, going into entrepreneurship, whatever it might be. Um. I guess my tip is always to stay in your nine to five as long as possible. <laughs> um, I I think if I hadn't been pushed out, I probably would have just because the financial strain of starting a business is real. Um, so until you're ready to take the leap, maybe you have your first investment check or you, you know, have your business model figured out to the to the place where you are, you can support yourself in that way. Um, my advice is to always kind of wait out the storm, even though it might be a little bit harder um, until you're actually ready to leave. Um, I would add um, doing kind of a risk assessment of yourself. Um, here you have three founders that are in very different places with their companies. Um, you have to also make an assessment of where you are in your life like what are the responsibilities that you have? Um, the ability to take a risk at, you know, recently graduating from college is very different than being 45 with uh, a couple of kids at home and, you know, a mortgage, right? Um, so understanding where you are and then being able to make that pivot. Um, I would also say for someone who is a solo founder, find yourself a co-founder. Uh, I don't advise going the route that I'm going. You need someone not only for just the general ideas and someone being able to see the things that you're missing, but that support system. Um, building your village first with the person that's working next to you is, I think, is a fantastic idea. So if you can find a co-founder or someone that is willing to go through some of these rigors with yourself, because it is really hard to explain to anyone how you are building a company when you can't just like, you're not building a widget, you can't hand it to them. You say, no, my company does these things. So having someone that's there with you in the day-to-day -day is really important. So co-founder, risk assessment of yourself and understanding that your story will be different than others. Um, not just reading the books and saying, this is the path that I take. Everyone's path is very windy, it's very different. And it's okay if your path is not the place others have gone. Absolutely. Awesome. I think at this point, we'll turn over to the audience, but but thank you to the three of you um, for putting up with me. Um, this has been, I, I've learned a lot. This has been incredible. Um, Winston, I, I think there's a question in the chat that was actually directed to one of the things that, that you brought up. Um, uh, the question is from Jessica. How do you distinguish between the worthwhile conversations and the fluff? Yeah, so I put a couple things in there about keeping meetings um, short and in beginning initial meetings, 50 to 30, 15 to 30 minutes, you know, don't, you don't necessarily commit to the one hour, hour and a half. But I think also just doing due diligence on the person you're going to be speaking with, like what is it you want out of the conversation, having that mapped out and not just going into it and exploring, say, oh, this person likes my idea or, or me, let me just kind of talk, like, what do you want to get out of it, being very purposeful. Um, in those early conversations and knowing that no one's going to do this per perfectly you're going to go in some conversations just aren't going to go well but being okay with that it is not a sense of failure it's not on you it's like you do have to do these things that are exploratory but being mindful of you don't need to have that second or third conversation if it's not going in the path that you that you wanted to you don't you're under no obligation um in that space also there are a lot of things that just can be done via email if it's okay to send a note and have a person kind of follow up along the way um and it's also very different if you're if it's a customer or potential investor that you want to chase different if you're pushing it than if a person is just kind of 
bringing you in. And I say this as someone, <clears throat> and I'll share this story. My idea and my um, company is attractive to certain people who really love the idea and want to be a part of the mission and think it's great. They don't all have sort of ideas that I can build on. <laughs> and a 45 minute conversation talking about um, how this would be great is not really serving the purpose. So I have to be really clear about that and sort of keep those conversations to um, a minimum. Uh, it has to be something that helps to move my company forward, helps to move me forward. And it's not to be cold hearted about it. It's just we only have 24 hours in a day. Um, and so some of those conversations are going to get pushed to email. Some of them are going to get pushed to DMs on LinkedIn and other places. And that's OK. I'm not going to lose a conversation. Let's be mindful of is this a five minute conversation that we can do um, through notes or is this something that we really need to talk about? Absolutely. Michelle or Ashley, do either of you want to add to that? Um, I think Winston's answer was pretty sufficient. Um, I do think that there is a, a difference between someone that you're trying to pursue versus someone that's just um, pursuing your asking questions. I tend, I think that tends to be like, you know, aspiring founders. That's what I usually get. And I try my best to do as many as I can. Um, within the time frame that I have. Um, if I'm pursuing somebody, it's it's very different because usually it's an investment or it's, it's a peer that I want to learn from that's in a later stage than I am. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's individual assessment. Um, but yeah, I think Winston's answer was pretty sufficient. Uh, it, to the extent that it's helpful, I just want to build on what Michelle said. Um, I'm here because people opened a door for me at a time where they weren't funding women. And so I feel very strongly that my job is to hold a door open for people who may not be walking through the front door. And so I, every other week, put a couple of hours of what we call GBT, give back time on my calendar. And I put half hour meetings in that period so that I am sort of taking all of the benefit of the things I've done wrong and sharing them with people who can maybe uh, not jump off so many cliffs as I did. And so I, I do think it's very important, whether you have started a company, whether you're thinking about starting a company, or you, whether you blew up a company, I think you have a perspective because of where you sit, regardless of where you are in life, to be able to um, do the work to improve equity here in Boston. And I think just want to encourage us to continue to do that collectively um, while protecting our time. Absolutely. Uh, and I think you had someone take you up on the offer of your time in the chat. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> um, I think Allison asked a good question, uh, connecting back to what we just chatted about. Um, how, how do you say, yeah? No, politely, um, or not, not politely. I don't know if, if politely is maybe the right way to put this. I think, how do you just say no, um, uh, given all these things that are, you know, being juggled um, this early on? Well, I don't, I don't know if you have to necessarily say no to the conversation. You can just have it in a different space. Maybe it's a conversation that can happen over email, as we were saying, or maybe you are pushing among. And I'll say, I, I agree with Ashley and Michelle's point. Like the, I do always talk to new founders. Um, um, in my former work, I spoke with a lot of high school and college kids. So a lot of them will reach out um, for advice. And that, those kids, I will always make a point. But even they will, will communicate via email and in, in a space that, that works best for us. So I don't know if you need to say no as much as maybe you're moving, moving the talk uh, a month out or if you're willing to just do it via email or if you know folks want to send you points of what they're looking for and being really efficient and every person will determine what works best for them um and some of this may just be personal to me i'll say look i had a uh an investor in boston who for a month we would have two to three hour conversations every week and it's great when this person who's invested millions across the city wants to talk to you and wants to meet you for coffee and at some point I said, wait, he's not going to invest in me. What, why do I keep doing this, right? He's not even offering me any resources to help with my company. We just sit down and have a conversation about how he loves my idea. So 
you know, that some of that had to slow down. It had to move to something else. So that's, that's the, that's what I'm sharing with entrepreneurs about being mindful of your time and where things are going. Uh, build on that point. Um, there was also, I had an investor kind of do the same thing recently, actually. And I've been talking to this investor for like a year and a half about my previous company and now my new company. And I had to have like a very just frank conversation and just say, you know, we've been talking for the past year. And I think you have all that you need to assess whether you'd like to invest. So, you know, with the interest of just time um, to not waste your time and also my time, um, if there is a possibility that you can give me an answer within the next week or so. And now the conversations are moving forward. So I think just being kind of frank and just honest because their, their time is just as valuable as yours. I try and do like, again, not, not everything has to be a 30 minute call. And so if someone calls and says, can you, if, if I have something to contribute, like I'm very eager to, to do so. If I'm not the best person, typically what I do is like, look, I really am excited about what you're building. I unfortunately don't have the ability to take this on right now, but here are, and I always try and do three, like here are three people or three references or three things that I think might be helpful. If there's anything else I can do via LinkedIn or anything else, please don't hesitate to reach out. And so really understanding where, so I'm very passionate about access, you know, increasingly healthcare, education, and immigration. And so if it's in that space, I feel like I have something to bring to the party and things beyond that, I sort of try and connect people to uh, others in my network who might, might be in a better position to help. Um, oh, it looks like we had a question come up here from Mark. Uh, Product coming to retail in Q1 of 2023, it's really being built over in China. So the mock is 5,000 is 32 bucks a unit. I'm also looking for an investor of $160,000. Do you think it's better to be taken as a loan or give up equity? Um, I'll leave this to the three of you. <laughs> um, Anybody have any thoughts? Take that one. So my, my second business catapult is providing working capital loans to CPG brands that are launching into retail. So um, we actually did a pilot with a company that we helped fund and she she got a $150,000 purchase order to launch into 300 doors in JCPenney. So I would say as much as you can, look for organizations like Catapult. And there are a few out there like Pipe, um, Ampla, AMPLA, and Clear. And they allow you to take basically working capital loans until you're able to pay them. Um, they will take a little bit of an interest fee, but I think as much equity as you can keep of your company, that would be my suggestion. Um, just because it's equity is just it's your it's your it's your capital, it's your money, it's it's basically your stake in the business. So as much of it as you can keep as possible, I would suggest that. Um, but definitely look up some of those um, some of the organizations and platforms that I just mentioned. Definitely. Uh, Winston or Ashley, either of you have anything you want to add? Accelerators and state programs are also a good place to check for capital at that level. Yeah, I agree with Michelle. Keep, keep as much equity in your company um, as possible. And I think your ask should be a little higher than 160. Um, not just the exact amount of what you need now. I would say you're looking for 250, 300 to give yourself some space if you're going if you're going the loan route or if you can find um, investment through grants, you should um, go a little higher to give yourself that space. I think that's right, absolutely. Um, and Michelle, I think uh, a few folks are asking if you can put some of those companies in the chat. Um, so we'd love if you can do that as well. Awesome. 